to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, I want to bring our attention to our primary text, it's verses 16 and 17 of 1 Corinthians 9, and in just a second, I'm going to read that for us, and then we'll have a word of prayer, just to commit our time together and our conversation to the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, where the apostle writes, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as much as we love you, and we acknowledge your might and your power and the glory of your name as we've been singing. We can cry out, holy, holy, holy to you. But we, Lord, admit that there are times when we want to serve you. And it's a joy. It is a privilege. Indeed, as the apostle says, it is a reward for us. But then there are other times when we don't want to serve you. When, for whatever reason... We shy away from your command and the calling that you have upon our lives. But it's precisely at, at those moments that we need to remember the words of Paul that we not only have a reward in the calling you've placed upon our lives, we also have a stewardship. And at those moments when we don't want to serve, it's when we still must serve for those duties and responsibilities that calling upon our lives is still there. And so as we gather to honor you today and to learn from your word, we ask that you would help us as individuals and as a congregation to be more effective in this coming year in our service to you, whether we are rendering that as a reward and out of our free will, or whether we are doing it as a stewardship and out of a sense of duty. Lead us to the end that we serve you nonetheless. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And amen. It was about two years ago, and I shared with you a devotion that I had been reading that I had started. Joy and Strength for the Pilgrim's Day. Uh, Mary Wilder Tileston was the editor of this devotion. It first came out in 1901. And uh, Forgotten Books, the publisher, uh, they published this. And those of you that enjoy reading... Uh, Forgotten Books is a publisher that you should become familiar with because they'll take old works in the original forms that they were first published, like the 1901 edition of this work, and then they'll just print it exactly like it appeared when that first publication came out. And there are a lot of excellent, excellent resources uh, that you can turn to that this publisher uh, has maintained in print. It was July 12 of 2017 when I shared with you this short statement from Sarah Stephen. She constantly yielded to that kind of selfishness which makes the writing or not writing of a letter depend upon the inclination of the moment. And I want you to unpack that with me for just a second. Uh, she constantly yielded to that kind of selfishness which makes the writing or not writing of a letter depend upon the inclination of the moment. What, 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 is, what is being get at? What is the purpose of that statement? So powerful, so, so poignant. What's the inclination of the moment? Let's start there. Right, how, how you feel. How do I feel at a given moment? Do, do I want to write the letter? Do I not want to write the letter? Because how I feel with respect to writing the letter, do I want to write it or do I not want to write it, will determine whether or not the letter gets written. And let me tell you, that is a very dangerous way to live one's life. And, and as Sarah Stevens said, it is an incredibly selfish way to live one's life. Ironically, we live in a day and age when we pride ourselves of being almost the pinnacle of the scientific era, which uh, depends upon reason and cognition in moving forward. But we have become an incredibly, highly emotive generation. And when you compare the way we live right now, and I say we, because it's not just younger generation, older generation, it's we Americans together. When you consider the way we live right now in comparison to the way our forefathers and foremothers lived, we are very much decision makers 
based upon emotions rather than decision makers based upon the sense of duty and responsibility. That was what impressed me so much about this devotion when I first came across it, was how much responsibility and one's duty to family and the larger society is emphasized in this. Here's another paragraph from that, that same reading, that July, uh, January 12 reading. This is by Alexander McLaren. No unwelcome tasks become any the less unwelcome by putting them off until tomorrow. It's only when they're behind us and done that we begin to find that there's a sweetness to be tasted afterwards and that the remembrance of unwelcome duties unhesitatingly done is actually welcome and pleasant. Accomplished, they are full of blessing and there's a smile on their faces as they leave us. But undone, they stand threatening and disturbing our tranquility and hindering our communion with God. If there be lying before you any bit of work from which you shrink, go straight up to it and do it at once. The only way to get rid of it is to do it. Let me tell you, is that not a good word for the beginning of the year? You know, for some of us, it may be as simple as clean that closet out. You know, you, you threw that stuff in there four years ago. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. That isn't a preacher exaggeration, right? You threw that in there four years ago. You said, I'm going to get to that. And it's still sitting there. Get that done. Because this is what happens to us. Exactly what McLaren said. Those things linger in our minds. And one task left undone becomes, it's a light, it's, it's not really a burden, but it's a weight on our minds. But add to that another small task left undone, and it's another way. Add another, and another, and another, and another, and now all of a sudden, you are hard pressed. Uh, it is a burden upon your mind, upon your very soul, of simple tasks added up, left undone. We, we have to do those things that are before us that fulfill our responsibilities and our duties. 20 years ago, the movie Gladiator came out, starring Russell Crowe as the, the star of the show, of the movie. Uh, he was portraying Maximus, who was a, a Roman general who was betrayed, and uh, of course, at the end of the story, is the hero of Rome once again. But in my opinion, the best dialogue in all of the movie comes rather early, and it's between Maximus and his servant Cicero. After Maximus is called in by Caesar, at that time it was Marcus Aurelius, uh, the time frame that the movie is set in. And Marcus Aurelius asks Maximus if he will take the responsibility of being Caesar, that he is going to relinquish his authority as Caesar. Now, this is fictitious, of course, but he's going to relinquish his authority as Caesar, and he wants to transfer all of his authority to Maximus for the sole reason that Maximus will then transfer the authority back to the Senate. For in the movie, Marcus Aurelius comes to the conclusion that it's too dangerous and it is not in the best interest of Rome for one man to have all of this power. And so he asks Maximus, will you do this? And he says, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want this authority. I don't want this responsibility. I want to go back to my family. I want to go back to farming. I, don't, I, I want to do away with these things. And Caesar says, that's exactly why you're the man who should do it. Precisely because you don't want the authority, it's why you should have the authority. And so after their conversation, Maximus goes back to his tent because they're in the field, they're on a campaign. And when he gets into his tent and he's deep in thought over the conversation that he's had with Caesar, he notices that his servant is tending to his weapons. And uh, he says to his servant Cicero, do you find it difficult to do your duty? And Cicero responds, sometimes I do what I want to. The rest of the time I do what I have to. See, the same is true for you and me, isn't it? Sometimes we have the good fortune of doing what we want to do. But for all of us in life, many times we have to do what we have to do. And, and that makes the difference between fulfilling our duties and responsibilities by doing them all of the time, whether we want to do them or we don't want to do them, or shirking our duties and our responsibilities because each time we come to the place where we don't want to do them, we give in to that selfishness that is determined by the inclination of the moment. 
And you see, any dialogue, any conversation on the topic of duty is really a dialogue and conversation about purpose. What is it that really drives a person in life? What is it that brings a person from one season to the next in life? And also any gospel conversation, since the gospel is the greatest purpose in life, is by default a conversation about duty and responsibility. That's precisely why the Apostle Paul, look back at 1 Corinthians 9, in verse 16. In leading up to verse 16, he's talking to the Corinthians about his rights as an apostle, that he has the right to help lead the church, and that he has an authority that's been given him, to him by God to help lead the church. But in no way, shape, or form does he want to abuse those rights and those authorities because he understands, first and foremost, he's a servant, not a leader. Sure, he's a leader in the church, but only as he is first a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 16, look, I preach the gospel and I have nothing of which to boast. Precisely because the gospel, the gospel simply means good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is that you have been forgiven of your sins, not because you've been able to muster up the spiritual formation to be forgiven, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And when you fall in love with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, then God gives you the spiritual ability to begin to change and become the man, the woman that he has called you to be. And you can't boast in that. The only boast you have, which is just a meager one, is that you recognize the reality of the salvation that Jesus Christ offered you. It's as if you were on the edge of a cliff and you were losing your grip. And someone came over strong enough to grab you and pull you up off the side of that cliff. Now, as soon as you got up and you dusted yourself off, you wouldn't say, well, what do you think of that? That was a lot of strength on my part, wasn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, you had to grab his hand. But if the Savior hadn't been there, you'd never been saved. And so it is with us in the gospel. We have nothing of which to boast. And he goes on to say that I must preach the gospel. I have nothing of which to boast. And preaching is a necessity that has been laid upon me. Yes, woe to me if I do not preach. And then look at what he says about the preaching of the gospel in verse 17. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. That is, it is a great privilege. But if against my will, then I have been entrusted with a stewardship. You see, as, as powerful... As the apostle was led by the Holy Spirit, he was still a human being like you and me. And as much as he had experienced in his relationship with God, and even the supernatural events surrounding his calling, he was still a human being like you and me. And there were days when he was enraptured in God's love, and he was so excited to do the will of God and to serve God wholeheartedly. No matter what was before him, he was going to serve Jesus Christ. And then there were days when he felt otherwise. There were days when he says here, sharing the gospel is to him a privilege. It is a great reward. And thus he willingly, enthusiastically shared the gospel with people. But then there were other days, for whatever reason, he didn't want to share the gospel. But on those days, when he didn't feel like sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel wasn't an option. He still had to share the gospel because it was a stewardship. It was a responsibility given to him by God. That's why he tells his younger pupil, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4.2. Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Timothy, preach the gospel when you have the time to prepare and you're excited about sharing it and you know the group that you're sharing to and you anticipate that they're going to receive it wholeheartedly and they're going to do something with it. Share in season. But Timothy... Also share the gospel when you haven't had the time to prepare. When all of a sudden the moment or the responsibility is upon you. Or maybe you don't really know the group that you're speaking to. And you wonder what their reaction will be. Or perhaps you know the group you're speaking to. And their reaction will be a violent one. Because they hate the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're in season, Timothy. Or out of season. You have a responsibility. Preach the gospel. If in season, it's a reward. Out of season, it's a stewardship. Now I want to back up with you for just a moment. From the gospel. To talk about just rewards and stewardships 
that God gives us in life in general, outside of the gospel, outside of our spiritual formation. There are duties and responsibilities that we have that are God-given that at times when we're fulfilling them, it's a reward. It's a great privilege. We really enjoy it. We look forward to it. At other times, not so much. It's a stewardship. Help me with that. What are some of the, the God-given duties and responsibilities that we have in this life? Parenting. Right? All right. Parenting. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Proverbs says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full. You know, the arrows being the children. Children are an incredible blessing from the Lord. It is a great responsibility to be given a child by the Lord and to have that child in your care. Moms, dads, grandmothers, grandfathers, you love your kids tremendously. You would give your lives for your children. Do you always want to fulfill your responsibilities in parenting them? Now, there are a lot of times when doing what you have to do in order to be the parent that God's called you to be, it's a stewardship, isn't it? Now, aren't there plenty of times as well, though, when serving your children through your leadership and your parenting, it is an incredible joy, and it gives you such meaning and fulfillment that it is a privilege, as the apostle says, it's a reward, it's a blessing. What else, along with um, parenting, do we have? God-given responsibilities that, yeah, cer certainly. I mean, and that's related to the aspect of child-rearing. Divorce in our society is, is quite rampant. When you look at the statistics coming off the last decade plus, divorce in the church is almost the same as it is in the larger society, and that's incredibly sobering, because the greatest gift uh, a man and a woman can give children that come into their lives is a solid home. A solid marriage. You ask kids again and again and again. You ask teenagers who've been through divorce. You ask adults who've been through divorce. You talk to Shannon. Shannon, Shannon went through that when she was 13 years old. You ask what kids want the most and what makes them feel the most secure. And it's, it is the duties and responsibilities between a man and a woman as husband and wife being fulfilled to one another. And, and when we get married, we fall in love with someone, we get married... We have a period of time there, the initial period of time. What do we call it? Boy, you're in the honeymoon. And the apostle would say, you're in the reward period there. I mean, you're doing this willingly. Oh, we get to live together. We get to travel together. We get to do things together. I mean, we're, this is awesome. We're together. How long does the honeymoon last? Well, yeah, who knows? Just, but, but nonetheless, it doesn't last the whole time. Because something happens at some point down the road where all of a sudden... You know what? What used to be something that was very exciting, and I looked at it as privilege and reward, all of a sudden this has become a stewardship. But guess what? That responsibility of loving that person and being committed to that person is still there. And not only is it important for you and for that person, if you're married, it's important for any children in your lives, and it's also important, even if you don't have children, for any people that share in your lives, because every marriage is being watched by the people around it. To see what the outcome of that marriage will be. And, you, and, and certainly that is the case with those marriages that are to be Christ-centered marriages. What else? A God-given responsibility that we have. That at times it's a reward, a privilege, we love it. Other times it's a stewardship. Job, work. Exactly. Uh, there, is, there is something about the human psyche that needs that sense of purpose and fulfillment. Um, and, and not only is it important for the individual... It's important for the larger society as well. When, uh, long before our nation was established, when the first people started coming over here and establishing uh, not even colonies at the time, just settlements, you can recall, and you know the scripture verse that was used to admonish every individual that was a part of the beginning of this nation, that, look, your duties and responsibilities fulfilled is so important that not one of you in this community can be a slacker. And as a matter of fact, if you become a slacker, the penalty and the price will be a heavy one. We are going to put a scripture passage right here at the forefront of our community, and it says this, those who do not work do not eat. Wow, how far we've come from that. But it's, it's, a, it's a dual fulfillment of responsibility and purpose. Again, there's something in us that we want to be purposeful. We want to fulfill 
uh, our purpose and we want to make a difference around us. It's in ingrained in us by the Creator. I was talking to an individual not long ago about um, just the equine industry and horses. And we were talking about horses that crit. And those of you that are into uh, equestrian activities, you'll know exactly what that is. And that can be incredibly dangerous for a horse. A horse that cribs is a horse that when it's in its stable, it's chewing the wood all around the stable. It'll chew the doors. It'll chew the walls. It'll chew to the point where it gets infected. And it'll in even sometimes begin to ingest some of the wood. A cribbing horse is a frustrated horse. A horse kept in a stable too long will automatically begin to crib or it'll have a broken spirit. But as long as the spirit in that horse is there to get out and do what horses do, if you, if you put it up in the stable too long, it will crib. And I was talking to this gentleman about addiction is the same way. The root of so many forms of addiction that you see in the lives of people is because ultimately they don't feel they're fulfilling a purpose. And they're turning to something that they think is going to give them some kind of meaning, some kind of, some kind of high, some kind of, of euphoria that they, they know they, they're not getting anywhere else. But yet if you had given them the task or you'd given them the ability to help, follow, help them follow through with the purpose to which they've been called or even understand the purpose to which they've been called, that person probably wouldn't have taken the path of addiction any more than a horse that's well pastured would crib. Now let's talk just a moment, not, not just about the secular and social responsibilities that we have of parenting and, and uh, being a spouse and also working and contributing to the larger society. Let's talk about some spiritual, spiritual rewards and stewardships that God has given us within the life of the community of faith that they're ours by default that we're Christians. These are our responsibilities. These are our duties that the Lord gives us. What are some things that God calls us to do? Right. Worship, worship the Lord through the reading of his word. What was that? Love people, right. What are some others? Care for the least of these. Make disciples. Tie. Get, you know, in, in all of this, what was that? Feed, feed, his, uh, feed his sheep, right. Make a difference, you know, uh, with respect to sharing the gospel. And if you're going to feed the sheep of God's pasture, you have to feed them with God's word. Again, when you're talking about the word of God, and we're gathering together for worship. Think about this. Worship ultimately is more than the communal gathering, this event that we call worship. Worship is ultimately what is taking place in your heart and in your mind with respect to the Holy Spirit and God's word, your relationship to the Lord. A young man at the early service, when asked what are our duties and responsibilities from a spiritual perspective, he said growth in holiness. And there's a passage that's actually mentioned a couple times in the psalm. It says, worship the Lord in the spirit of holiness, because that is ultimately what God desires in worship, that we would be changed from the inside in order to live more holy lives for him. All of us would argue that an individual that comes to a communal activity of worship, as we call it, but then turns around and walks out of the doors of the sanctuary and lives a life consistently outside the will of God, Knowing full well the unholiness that the individual is participating in is something God condemns, that that individual never really worshiped. Because if you really worship the Lord, that worship is more than just the communal activity. That worship is the, the change. It's the inner disposition toward God. So when it comes to the duties and responsibilities we have, we need to serve the Lord and seek a holiness with that inner disposition where it's the word of God not the world that's dictating our standards. And we also need to seek that fellowship and communion on a regular basis with the body of Christ in the event that we call worship as well. I can't tell you how many people over the years have shared with me uh, as a pastor, as they're wrestling with issues, say issues of temptation or issue of serving the Lord. They're, they're gauging their service to the Lord based upon how they feel. I have a certain inclination, I have a certain temptation, I have a certain desire, and I can't seem to shake it. And so since I can't seem to shake it, I guess I'll just go with it. Listen, friend, you cannot let your feelings dictate what's right and wrong. 
The word of God must dictate for you what's right and wrong. And when God tells you something is right, it doesn't matter what your feelings say. It will always be right. When God tells you something's wrong, it doesn't matter what your feelings say. It will be wrong. We have to surrender ourselves to God's truth, to God's word. Again, in the training of animals, whether you're talking about horses or you're talking about dogs, those who are trainers will tell you pretty quick. If, say your canine, for example. If your dog only obeys you when it wants to obey you, it's your companion. When your dog obeys you when it doesn't want to obey you, then you're its master. Jesus is a companion to a lot of people who go to church. He's not the master. They want, they want rewards, the treats. I always want it to be a treat. I'll serve for a treat. But what about when there's no treat and it becomes a stewardship? Colossians 1.25, the apostle says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. I'm doing this as unto the Lord because it's the calling he's placed upon my life, but I'm doing it for the church. I'm doing it for the people of God, that the word of God would be fulfilled. And 1 Timothy 1.4 where he tells again his young pupil, Timothy, do not pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. Now I read it from the New American Standard Version because it renders the Greek word that is used for, that is translated stewardship the vast majority of times, it renders it administration, which is the closest sense to stewardship of any of the English translations that I looked at. But I want to read it to you with the word stewardship being consistently rendered. Do not pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the stewardship of God, which is by faith. Don't get caught up in, in ridiculous theological debates, but stay focused on the most important thing, which is the stewardship you've been given by God through faith. Which brings us back to 1 Corinthians chapters 9 and 10. In chapter 9, Paul said, look, the most important thing that I am going to do with my life is preach the gospel. And there are times when I want to preach the gospel, and I'm excited to preach the gospel, and those are moments of reward for me. But then there are times when I really don't want to preach the gospel, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's a stewardship for me. And he shows us how important duty and responsibility, how important stewardship is in our lives and our service to the Lord. Because if we don't come to that place where Jesus is our master, then we're not really his, his, his children. We're not really following him. We're still serving him selfishly just for reward. And it is a warning to us. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, the apostle continues this conversation into this section of scripture. Brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That is, baptized simply means immersed in Greek. All of them were immersed in the cloud of the glory of the Lord when he filled the tabernacle. All of them were immersed in the cloud when, when they followed the cloud in the wilderness. All of them were immersed as they passed through the sea miraculously. All of them, verse 3, ate the same spiritual food, the manna. All of them drank the same spiritual drink that came, <coughs> excuse me, that came from the rock. And then he says this, verse 5. But with most of them God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And these became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Don't seek for God to be your companion. Seek for God to be your master. And then he says that they followed after worldly things. They lusted after worldly things. Look at the examples that he gives. Verse 7, they became idolaters. Verse 8, they committed sexual immorality. And then as the passage goes on, they were incredibly divisive, constantly murmuring and gossiping and complaining and backbiting against one another. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. They followed after worldliness, idolatry, sexual immorality, and pervasive uh, divisiveness were the mark of that. Sound familiar? And yet he says to his children this, 
Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. For no temptation has overtaken you except as is such and is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. You know, it's easy for us to serve when we want to serve. But will we serve when we don't want to serve? Will we serve when the moment of temptation is set in and you feel like, I just can't shake this thing. I can't shake this feeling. I can't get past this. I can't get over this hill somehow, some way. No, don't ever say that to yourself. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. For the word of God says, anytime you're tempted, it's because you're a soldier being tested. And if God's testing you, he's got a plan for you. And it doesn't matter how long it lasts, doesn't matter how hard it seems. If you will keep fighting, God will show you the way to victory. Because the victory will be through him, not through you. So the one thing that you would have correct is saying, you know, I'm weak, I can't do this. You're right, you're weak, but he's strong. You're right, you can't do this, but he can and so the question is, as we continue our journey into 2019, do you recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as your companion or as your master? For if he's your master, you're going to serve him when you want to, and it's a reward and a privilege. But you're also going to serve him when you don't want to, because you have the stewardship from the living God. And that is the secret to life, to live beyond yourself. As the worship team comes up, to close us out, I want to share this poem with you. It's by the late Helen Steiner Rice, one of the great American poets. And it's titled, Two Palestinian Seeds. And it's really the difference between living for self and, and living for something outside of yourself. First God, and then others, starting with your family. A very favorite story of mine is about two seas in Palestine. One is a sparkling sapphire jewel, its waters are clean and clear and cool. Along its shores the children play, and travelers seek it on their way. And nature gives so lavishly her choicest gems to the Galilee. But on to the south the Jordan flows into a sea where nothing grows. No splash of fish, no singing bird, no children's laughter is ever heard. The air hangs heavy all around, and nature shuns this barren ground. Both seas receive the Jordan's flow. The water is just the same, we know. But one of the seas, like liquid sun, can warm the hearts of everyone, while further south another sea is dead and dark and miserly. It takes each drop the Jordan brings, and to each drop it fiercely clings. It hoards and holds the Jordan's waves until, like shackled, captured slaves, the fresh, clear Jordan turns to salt and dies within the Dead Sea's vault. But the Jordan flows on rapturously as it enters and leaves the Galilee. For every drop the Jordan gives becomes a laughing wave that lives. For the Galilee gives back each drop and its waters flow and never stop. And in this laughing living sea that takes and gives so generously, we find the way to life and living. It's not in keeping, but in giving. Yes, there are two Palestinian seas, and mankind is fashioned after these. Give your life to the master of all creation, and you will live and live abundantly. But living abundantly for him means you're going to serve him when you want to, but you're also going to serve him when you don't want to. That's what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And so as we close out our worship this morning and we sing our, our closing song, bringing tribute to his holy name, the name of Jesus, I invite you to respond to the Lord as your head. You may have an area of your life that you've been shirking your responsibility for a long time, and the Lord has said to you this morning, just do it. Come on, let's do this. And this is your year. 2019 is your year. Come forward and ask the Lord for the strength to do whatever it is that he's challenged you. And some of you, you may have resonated completely with this aspect of, you know, God is my companion, God is my master, and you're really honest with yourself, and you're like, you know what, he's not my master, I just want him to be a friend that gives me rewards and treats now and again. That, that, that is not salvation, friend. Salvation comes in the lordship of Jesus Christ. Make him your master, become his servant, and then you will find everything you could have ever wanted. 